The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Chapter 19 Tying Up Daytimes. An Astronomical Theory. Running a Temperance Revival. The Duke of Bridgewater. The Troubles of Royalty. Two or three days and nights went by. I reckoned I might say they swum by. They slid along so quiet and smooth and lovely. Here is the way we put in the time. It was a monstrous big river down there, sometimes a mile and a half wide. We run nights and laid up and hid daytimes. Soon as night was most gone, we stopped navigating and tied up, nearly always in the dead water under a towhead and then cut young cottonwoods and willows and hid the raft with them then we set out the lines next we slid into the river and had a swim so as to freshen up and cool off then we sat down on the sandy bottom where the water was about knee-deep and watched the daylight come not a sound anywheres perfectly still just like the whole world was asleep only sometimes the bullfrogs a-cluttering maybe the first thing to see, looking away over the water, was a kind of dull line. That was the woods on t'other side. You couldn't make nothing else out. Then a pale place in the sky. Then more paleness, spreading around. Then the river softened up a way off, and weren't black any more, but gray. You could see little dark spots drifting along ever so far away, trading scows, and such things and long black streaks, rafts. Sometimes you could hear a sweep squeaking, or jumbled up voices. It was so still. And sounds come so far, and by and by, you could see a streak on the water, which you know by the look of the streak that there's a snag there in the swift current, which breaks on it and makes that streak look that way. And if you see the mist curl up off the water, and the east reddens up, and the river and you make out a log cabin in the edge of the woods away on the bank on t other side of the river being a wood yard likely and piled by them cheats so you can throw a dog through it anywheres then the nice breeze springs up and comes fanning you from over there so cool and fresh and sweet to smell on account of the woods and the flowers but sometimes not that way because they've left dead fish lying around, gars and such, and they do get pretty rank. And next you've got this full day, and everything smiling in the sun, and the songbirds just going it. A little smoke couldn't be noticed now, so we would take some fish off of the lines and cook up a hot breakfast. And afterwards, we would watch the lonesomeness of the river, and kind of lazy along, and by and by lazy off to sleep wake up by and by and look to see what done it and maybe see a steamboat coughing along upstream so far as toward the other side you couldn't tell nothing about her only whether she was a stern wheel or a side wheel then for about an hour there wouldn't be nothing to hear nor nothing to see just solid lonesomeness next you'd see your raft sliding by away off yonder and maybe a galoot on it chopping because they're most always doing it on the raft you see the axe flash and come down you don't hear nothing you see that axe go up again and by the time it's above a man's head then you hear the crunk it had took all that time to come over the water so we would put in the day lazying around listening to the stillness once there was a thick fog and the rafts and things that went by was beating tin pans so the steamboats wouldn't run over them a scow or a raft went by so close we could hear them talking and cussing and laughing heard them plain but we couldn't see no sign of them it made you feel crawly it was like spirits carrying on that way in the air jim said he believed it was spirits but i says no spirits wouldn't say durn the durn fog soon as it was night out we shoved when we got her out to about the middle we let her alone and let her float wherever the current wanted her to then we lit the pipes and dangled our legs in the water 
and talked about all kinds of things. We was always naked, day and night, whenever the mosquitoes would let us. The new clothes Buck's folks made for me was too good to be comfortable, and besides, I didn't go much on clothes nohow. Sometimes we'd have that whole river all to ourselves for the longest time. Yonder was the banks and the islands across the water, and maybe a spark, which was a candle in a cabin window, and sometimes on the water you could see a spark or two on a raft or a scow, you know, and maybe you could hear a fiddle or a song coming over from one of them crafts. It's lovely to live on a raft. We had the sky up there, all speckled with stars, and we used to lay on our backs and look up at them, and discuss about whether they was made or only just happened. Jim, he allowed they was made, but I allowed they happened. I judged it would have took too long to make so many. Jim said the moon could have laid them. Well, that looked kind of reasonable, so I didn't say nothing against it because I've seen a frog lay most as many. So, of course, it could be done. We used to watch the stars that fell, too, and see them streak down. Jim allowed they'd got spoiled and was hove out of the nest. Once or twice of a night, we would see a steamboat slipping along in the dark, and now and then she would belch a whole world of sparks up out of her chimbleys and they would rain down in the river and look awful pretty. Then she would turn a corner, and her lights would wink out, and her powwow shut off, and leave the river still again. And by and by, her waves would get to us a long time after she was gone, and juggle a raft a bit, and after that you wouldn't hear nothing, for you couldn't tell how long, except maybe frogs or something. After midnight, the people on shore went to bed, and then for two or three hours the shores was black. No more sparks in the cabin windows. These sparks was our clock. The first one that showed again meant morning was coming. So we hunted a place to hide and tie up right away. One morning, about daybreak, I found a canoe and crossed over a chute to the main shore. It was only two hundred yards and paddled about a mile up a creek amongst the cypress woods to see if I couldn't get some berries. Just as I was passing a place where a kind of a cow path crossed the creek, here comes a couple of men tearing up the path as tight as they could foot it. I thought I was a goner, for whenever anybody was after anybody, I judged it was me, or maybe Jim. I was about to dig out from there in a hurry, but they was pretty close to me then, and sung out and begged me to save their lives, said they hadn't been doing nothing, and was being chased for it, said there was men and dogs a-coming, they wanted to jump right in, but I says, Don't you do it! I don't hear the dogs and horses yet. You've got time to crowd through the brush, and get up the creek a little ways, then you take to the water, and wade down to me and get in, That'll throw the dogs off the scent. They done it, and soon as they was aboard, I let out for our towhead. And in about five or ten minutes, we heard the dogs, and the men away off shouting. We heard them come along toward the creek, but couldn't see them. They seemed to stop and fool around a while. Then as we got further and further away all the time, we couldn't hardly hear them at all. By the time we had left the mile of the woods behind us and struck the river, everything was quiet, and we paddled over to the towhead and hid in the cottonwoods and was safe. One of these fellows was about seventy or upwards and had a bald head and very gray whiskers. He had an old battered-up slouch hat on and a greasy blue woolen shirt and ragged old blue jeans breeches stuffed into his boot tops and home knit galooshes no he only had one he had an old long-tailed blue jeans coat with slick brass buttons flung over his arm and both of them had big fat ratty-looking carpet bags the other fellow was about thirty 
and dressed about as ornery. After breakfast, we all laid off and talked, and the first thing that comes out was that these chaps didn't know one another. What got you into trouble? says the bald-headed, to to other chap. Well, I'd been selling an article to take the tartar off the teeth, and it does take it off too, and generally the enamel along with it. But I stayed about one night longer than I ought to, and was just in the act of sliding out when I ran across you on the trail this side of town, and you told me they were coming, and begged me to help you to get off. So I told you I was expecting trouble myself, and would scatter out with you. That's the whole yarn. What's yawn? Well, I'd been running a little temperance revival there about a week, and was the pet of the women folk, big and little, for I was making it mighty warm for the rummies, I tell ya, and taking as much as five or six dollars a night, ten cents a head, children and diggers free, and business a growing all the time, when somehow or another a little report got around last night that I had a way of putting in my time with a private jug on the sly. A nigger rousted me out this morning, and told me the people was gathering on the quiet with their dogs and horses, and they'd be along pretty soon, and give me about half hour's start, and then run me down if they could. And if they got me, they'd tar and feather me, and ride me out on a rail, sure. I didn't wait for no breakfast. I weren't hungry. Old oh, man, said the young one, I reckon we might double-team it together. What do you think? I ain't undisposed. What's your line, mainly? Yeah, a printer by trade. Do a little in patent medicines, theatre actor, tragedy. You know, take a turn to mesmerism and phrenology when there's a chance. Teach singing geography school for a change. Sling a lecture sometimes. Oh, I do lots of things. Most anything that comes handy. So it ain't work. What's your lay? I've done considerable in the doctoring way in my time. Laying on our hands is my best halt for cancer and paralysis and such things. And I can tell you a fortune pretty good when I've got someone along to find out the facts for me. Preaching's my line, too. And working camp meetings and missionarying around. Nobody ever said anything for a while. Then the young man hove a sigh and says, Alas. What are you alassin about? says the bald head. To think I should have lived to be leading such a life, and be degraded down into such company. And he begun to wipe the corner of his eye with a rag. Durn your skin. Ain't the company good enough for you? says the bald head. Pretty pert and uppish. Yes, it is good enough for me. It's as good as I deserve. For who fetched me so low when I was so high? I did myself. I don't blame you, gentlemen. Far from it. I don't blame anybody. I deserve it all. Let the cold world do its worst. One thing I know. There's a grave somewhere for me. The world may go on just as it's always done, and take everything from me. Loved ones, property, everything. But it can't take that. Some day I'll lie down in it and forget it all, and my poor broken heart will be at rest. He went on a wiping. Drop your poor broken heart, says the bald head. What are you heaving your poor broken heart at us for? We ain't done nothing. No, I know you haven't. I ain't blaming you, gentlemen. I brought myself down. Yes, I did it myself. It's right I should suffer. Perfectly right. I don't make any moan. Brought you down from war. War was you brought down from? Ah, uh, you would not believe me. The world never believes. Let it pass. Tis no matter. The secret of my birth. The secret of your birth? Do you mean to say? Gentlemen, says the young man, very solemn, I will reveal it to you, for I feel I may have confidence in you. By rights, I am a duke. Jim's eyes bugged out when he heard that, and I reckon mine did too. Then the bald head says, No, you can't mean it. Yes, my great-grandfather, eldest son of the Duke of Bridgewater, fled to this country about the end of the last century to breathe the pure air of freedom, married here, and died, leaving a son, his own father, dying about the same time. The second son of the late Duke seized the titles and estates. The infant real Duke was ignored. 
i am the lineal descendant of that infant i am the rightful duke of bridgewater and here am i forlorn torn from my high estate hunted of men despised by the cold world ragged worn heartbroken and degraded to the companionship of felons on a raft jim pitied him ever so much and so did i we tried to comfort him but he said it weren't much use he couldn't be much comforted said if we was a mind to acknowledge him that would do him more good than most anything else so we said we would if he would tell us how he said we ought to bow when we spoke to him and say your grace or my lord or your lordship and he wouldn't mind if we called him plain bridgewater which he said was a title anyway and not a name and one of us ought to wait on him at dinner and do any little thing for him he wanted done well that was all easy so we done it all through dinner jim stood around and waited on him and says will your grace have some of this or some of that and so on and a body could see it was mighty pleasing to him but the old man got pretty silent by and by didn't have much to say and didn't look pretty comfortable over all that petting that was going on around that duke he seemed to have something on his mind so along in the afternoon he says looky here bilgewater he says i'm nation sorry for you but you ain't the only person that's had troubles like that no no you ain't you ain't the only person that's been snaked down wrongfully out in a high place alas no you ain't the only person that's had a secret of his birth and by jigs he begins to cry hold what do you mean bilgewater can i trust you says the old man still sort of sobbing to the bitter death he took the old man by the hand and squeezed it and says that secret of your being speak bilgewater i am the late dolphin i bet you jim and me stared this time then the duke says you are what yes my friends it is true your eyes are looking at the very moment on the poor disappeared dolphin louis the seventeenth son of louis the sixteenth and mary antoinette you at your age no you mean you're the late charlemagne you must be six or seven hundred years old at the very least trouble has done it bilgewater trouble has done it trouble has brung the gray hairs and this premature baldatude yes gentlemen you see before you in blue jeans and misery the wandering exiled trampled upon and suffering wrathful king of france well he cried and took on so that me and jim didn't know hardly what to do we was so sorry and so glad and proud we'd got him with us too so we set in like we done before with the duke and tried to comfort him but he said it weren't no use nothing but to be dead and done with it all could do him any good though he said it often made him feel easier and better for a while if people treated him according to his rights and got down on one knee to speak to him and always called him your majesty and waited on him first at meals and didn't sit down in his presence till he asked them so jim and me set to majestying him and doing this and that and to other for him and standing up till he told us we might sit down this done him heaps of good and so he got cheerful and comfortable but the duke kind of scoured on him and didn't look a bit satisfied with the way things was going still the king acted real friendly toward him and said the duke's great-grandfather and all the other dukes of village water was a good deal thought of by his father and was allowed to come to the palace considerable but the duke stayed huffy a good while till by and by the king says like as not we got to be together a blamed long time on this her raft bilgewater and so what's use o your being so sour 
It'll only make things uncomfortable. It ain't my fault I weren't born a duke. It ain't your fault you weren't born a king. So what's the use to worry? Make the best of things the way you find em, says I. That's my motto. This ain't no bad thing that we've struck here. Plenty grub and easy life. Come, give us your hand, Duke, and let's all be our friends. The Duke done it, and Jim and me was pretty glad to see it. It took away all the uncomfortableness, and we felt mighty good over it, because it would have been a miserable business to have any unfriendliness on the raft. For what you want, above all things, on a raft, is for everybody to be satisfied and feel right and kind towards the others. It didn't take me long to make up my mind that these liars weren't no kings nor dukes at all, but just low-down humbugs and frauds. But I never said nothing, never let on, kept it to myself. It's the best way. Then you don't have no quarrels, and don't get into no trouble. If they wanted us to call them kings and dukes, I hadn't no objections long as it would keep peace in the family and it weren't no use to tell jim so i didn't tell him if i never learnt nothing else out of pap i learned that the best way to get along with this kind of people is to let them have their own way End of chapter nineteen the adventures of huckleberry finn by mark twain chapter twenty Huck explains, laying out a campaign, working the camp meeting, a pirate at the camp meeting, the duke as a printer. They asked us considerable many questions, wanted to know what we covered up the raft that way for, and laid by in the daytime instead of running. Was Jim a runaway nigger? Says I, goodness sakes! would a runaway nigger run south no they allowed he wouldn't i had to account for things some way so i says my folks was living in pike county in missouri when i was born and they all died off but me and pa and my brother ike pa he'd break up and go down and live with uncle ben who's got a little one horse place on the river four to four mile below orleans pa was pretty poor and had some debts but when he squared up there weren't nothing left but sixteen dollars and our nigger jim that weren't enough to take us fourteen hundred mile deck passage nor other way well when the river rose pa had a streak of luck one day he catched this piece of a raft so we reckoned we'd go down to orleans on it pa's luck didn't hold out the steamboat run over the forward corner of the raft one night and we all went overboard and dove under the wheel jim and me come up all right but pa was drunk and ike was only four years old so they never come up no more well for the next day or two we had considerable trouble because people was always coming out in skiffs and trying to take jim away from me saying they believed he was a runaway nigger we don't run daytimes no more now nights they don't bother us the duke says leave me alone to cipher out a way so we can run in the daytime if we want to i'll think the thing over i'll invent a plan that'll fix it we'll let it alone for today because of course we don't want to go by that town yonder in daylight it mightn't be healthy towards night it begun to darken up and looked like rain the heat lightning was squirting around low down in the sky and the leaves was beginning to shiver it was going to be pretty ugly it was easy to see that so the duke and the king went to overhauling our wigwam to see what the beds was like my bed was a straw tick better than jim's which was a corn shuck tick there's always cobs around about in the shuck tick and they poke into you and hurt and when you roll over the dry shuck sound like you was rolling over a pile of dead leaves it makes such a rustling that you wake up well the duke allowed he would take my bed but the king allowed he wouldn't he says 
I should have reckoned the difference in rank would have suggested to you that a corn shuck bed weren't just fitten for me to sleep in. Your grace'll take the shuck bed himself. Jim and me was in a sweat again for a minute, being afraid there was going to be some more trouble among them. So we was pretty glad when the duke says, "'Tis my fate to be always ground into the mire under the iron heel of oppression. Misfortune has broken my once haughty spirit. I yield, I submit. Tis my fate. I am alone in the world. Let me suffer. Can bear it. We got away as soon as it was good and dark. The king told us to stand well out towards the middle of the river, and not show a light till we got a long ways below the town. We come in sight of the little bunch of lights by and by, that was the town, you know, and slide by, about a half a mile out, all right. When we was three-quarters of a mile below, we hoisted up our signal lantern, and about ten o'clock it come on to rain and blow and thunder and lightning like everything. So the king told us to both stay on watch till the weather got better. Then him and the duke crawled into the wigwam and turned in for the night. It was my watch below till twelve, but I wouldn't a turned in anyway if I had a bed, because a body don't see such a storm as that every day in the week, not by a long sight. My souls, how the wind did scream along, and every second or two there'd come a glare that lit up the white caps for about a mile around and you'd see the islands looking dusty through the rain and the trees thrashing around in the wind then comes a whack bum bum bumble umble bum 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 and the thunder would go a rumbling and grumbling away and quit and then rip comes another flash and another sucked oligar the waves most washed me off the raft sometimes, but I hadn't any clothes on, and didn't mind. We didn't have no trouble about snags. The lightning was glaring and flittering around so constant that we could see them plenty soon enough to throw her head this way or that and miss them. I had the middle watch, you know, but I was pretty sleepy by that time, so Jim said he would stand the first half for it for me. He was always mighty good that way, Jim was. I crawled into the wigwam, but the king and the duke had their legs sprawled out, so there weren't no show for me. So I laid outside. I didn't mind the rain, because it was warm, and the waves weren't running so high now. About two, they come up again, though, and Jim was going to call me, but he changed his mind because he reckoned they weren't high enough to get to do any harm. But he was mistaken about that, for pretty soon, all of a sudden, along comes a regular ripper, and watched me overboard. It most killed Jim a laughing. He was the easiest nigger to laugh that ever was, anyway. I took the watch, and Jim, he laid down and snored away, and by and by, the storm let up for good and all and the first cabin light that showed i roused him out and we slid the raft into hiding quarters for the day the king got out a ratty old deck of cards after breakfast and him and the duke played seven up a while five cents a game then they got tired of it and allowed they would lay out the campaign as they called it the duke went down into his carpet bag and fetched up a lot of little printed bills and read them out out loud one bill said the celebrated dr armand de montalban of paris would lecture on the science of phrenology at such and such a place on the blank day of blank at ten cents admission and furnish charts of character at twenty-five cents apiece the duke said that was him in another bill he was the world-renowned shakespearean tragedian garrick the younger or drury lane london in other bills he had a lot of other names and done other wonderful things like finding water and gold with a divining rod dissipating witch spells and so on by and by he says but the historic muse is the darling have you ever trod the boards royalty 
No, says the king. You shall then, before you're three days older, fallen grandeur, says the duke. The first good town we come to, we'll hire a hall, and do the sword fight in Richard the Third and the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet. How does that strike you? I'm in, up to the hub, for anything that will pay, Bilgewater. But, you see, I don't know nothing about playin' actin', and hain't ever seen much of it. I was too small when Pap used to have em at the palace. Do you reckon you can learn me? Easy. All right. I'm just a freezin' for something fresh, anyway. Let's commence right away. So the duke, he told him all about who Romeo was, and who Juliet was, and said he was used to being Romeo, so the king could be Juliet. But if Juliet's such a young gal, duke, my peeled head and my white whiskers is going to look uncommon odd on her, maybe. No, don't you worry. These country jakes won't ever think of that. Besides, you know, you'll be in costume, and that makes all the difference in the world. Juliet's in a balcony, enjoying the moonlight before she goes to bed, and she's got on her nightgown and her ruffled nightcap. Here are the costumes for the parts. He got out two or three curtain calico suits, which he said was medieval armor for Richard the Third and to other chap, and a long white cotton nightshirt and a ruffled nightcap to match. The king was satisfied, so the duke got out his book and read the parts over in the most splendid spread eagle way, prancing around and acting at the same time to show how it had got to be done. Then he gave the book to the king and told him to get his part by heart. There was a little one-horse town about three miles down the band, and after dinner the duke said he had ciphered out his idea about how to run in daylight without being dangerous some for Jim. So he allowed he would go down to town and fix that thing. The king allowed he would go too and see if he couldn't strike something. We was out of coffee, so Jim said I'd better go along with them in the canoe and get some. When we got there, there weren't nobody stirring, streets empty, and perfectly dead and still, like Sunday. We found a sick nigger sunning himself in a back yard, and he said everybody that weren't too young or too sick or too old was gone to camp meeting about two mile back in the woods. The king got the directions and allowed he'd go and work that camp meeting for all it was worth, and I might go too. The duke said what he was after was a printing office. We found it a little bit of a concern up over a carpenter shop. Carpenters and printers all gone to the meeting, and no doors locked. It was a dirty, littered-up place, and had ink marks and handbills with pictures of horses and runaway niggers on them all over the walls. The duke shed his coat and said he was all right now, so me and the king lit out for the camp meeting. We got there in about a half an hour fairly dripping, for it was most awful hot day. There was as much as a thousand people there from twenty mile around. The woods was full of teams and wagons hitched to everywheres, feeding out of the wagon troughs and stopping to keep off the flies. There was sheds made out of poles and roofed over with branches where they had lemonade and gingerbread to sell and piles of watermelons and green corn and such like truck. The preaching was going on under the same kinds of sheds, only they was bigger and held crowds of people. The benches was made out of a outside slab of logs with holes bored in the round side to drive sticks into four legs. They didn't have no backs. The preachers had high platforms to stand on at one end of the sheds. The women had on sunbonnets, and some had linsey woolly frocks. Some gingham ones, and a few of the young ones had on calico. Some of the young men was barefooted, and some of the children didn't have on any clothes but just a tow linen shirt. Some of the old women was knitting and some of the young folks was courting on the sly. The first shed we come to, the preacher was lining out a hymn. He lined out two lines. Everybody sung it, 
and it was kind of grand to hear it. There was so many of them, and they done it in such a rousing way. Then he lined out two more of them to sing, and so on. The people woke up more and more, and sung louder and louder. And towards the end, some began to groan, and some began to shout. Then the preacher began to preach, and begun in earnest, too and went weaving first to one side of the platform and then on the other and then a-leaning down over the front of it with his arms and his body going all the time and shouting his words out with all his might and every now and then he would hold up his bible and spread it open and kind of pass it around this way and that shouting it's the brazen serpent in the wilderness look upon it and live and people would shout out glory amen and so he went on and the people groaning and crying and saying amen oh come to the mourner's bench come black with sin amen come sick and sore amen come lame and halt and blind amen come poor and needy sunk in shame amen come all that's worn and soiled and suffering come with a broken spirit come with a contrite heart come in your rags and sin and dirt the waters that cleanse is free the door of heaven stands open oh enter and be at rest amen, amen. glory glory, glory hallelujah. hallelujah and so on you couldn't make out what the preacher said any more on account of the shouting and crying folks got up everywhere as in the crowd and worked their way just by main strength to the mourner's bench, with the tears running down their faces, and when all the mourners had got up there to the front benches in the crowd, they sung and shouted and flung themselves down on the straw, just crazy and wild. Well, the first I knowed, the king got a-going, and you could hear him over everybody, and next he went a-charging up on to the platform, and the preacher he begged him to speak to the people and he done it he told them he was a pirate been a pirate for thirty years out in the indian ocean and his crew was thinned out considerable last spring in a fight and he was home now to take out some fresh men and thanks to goodness he'd been robbed last night and put ashore off of a steamboat without a cent and he was glad of it it was the blessedest thing that ever happened to him, because he was a changed man now, and happy for the first time in his life, and poor as he was, he was going to start right off and work his way back to the Indian Ocean, and put the rest of his life trying to turn the pirates into the true path, for he could do it better than anybody else, being acquainted with all pirate crews in that ocean, and though it would take him a long time to get there without money, he would get there anyway and every time he convinced a pirate he would say to him don't you thank me don't you give me no credit it all belongs to them dear people in pokeville camp meeting natural brothers and benefactors of the race and that dear preacher there the truest friend a pirate ever had and then he busted into tears and so did everybody then somebody sings out take up a collection for him take up a collection well a half a dozen made up a jump to do it but somebody sings out let him pass the hat around then everybody said it the preacher too so the king went all through the crowd with his hat swabbing his eyes and blessing the peoples and praising them and thanking them for being so good to the poor pirates away off there and every little while the prettiest kind of girls with the tears running down their cheeks would up and ask him would he let them kiss him for to remember him by and he always done it and some of them he hugged and kissed as many as five or six times and he was invited to stay a week and everybody wanted him to live in their houses and said they'd think it was an honor but he said as this was the last day of the camp meeting he couldn't do no good and besides he was in a sweat to get on to the indian ocean right off and go to work on the pirates when we got back to the raft and he come to count up 
he found he had collected eighty-seven dollars and seventy-five cents. And then he had fetched away a three-gallon jug of whiskey, too, that he found under a wagon when he was starting home through the woods. The king said, take it all around. It laid over any day he'd ever put in, in the missionarying line. He said it weren't no use talking. Heathens don't amount to shucks, alongside of pirates to work a camp meeting with. The duke was thinking he'd been doing pretty well till the king come to show up, but after that he didn't think so so much. He had set up and printed off two little jobs for farmers in that printing office, horse bills, and took the money, four dollars, and he had got in ten dollars worth of advertisements for the paper, which he said he would put in for four dollars if they would pay in advance, so they done it. The price of the paper was two dollars a year, but he took in three subscriptions for half a dollar apiece on condition of them paying him in advance. They were going to pay in cordwood and onions as usual, but he said he had just bought the concern and knocked down the price as low as he could afford it and was going to run it for cash. He set up a little piece of poetry which he made himself out of his own head, three verses, kind of sweet and saddish. The name of it was, yes, crush cold world, this breaking heart. And he left that all set up and ready to print in the paper and didn't charge nothing for it. Well, he took in nine dollars and a half and said he'd done a pretty square day's work for it. Then he showed us another little job he printed and hadn't charged for because it was for us. It had a picture of a runaway nigger with a bundle on a stick over his shoulder and two hundred dollar reward under it. The reading was all about Jim and just described him to a dot. It said he run away from St. Jacques' plantation for the mile below New Orleans last winter and likely went north and whoever would catch him and send him back he could have the reward and expenses now says the duke after tonight we can run in the daytime if we want to whenever we see anybody coming we can tie jim hand and foot with a rope and lay him in the wigwam and show this handbill and say we captured him up the river and were too poor to travel on a steamboat so we got this little raft on credit from our friends and are going down to get the reward handcuffs and chains would look still better on jim but it wouldn't go well with the story of us being so poor too much like jewelry ropes are the correct thing we must preserve the unities as we say on the boards we all said the duke was pretty smart and there couldn't be no trouble about running daytimes we judged we could make miles enough that night to get out of the reach of the powwow. We reckoned that the Duke's work in the printing office was going to make in that little town. Then we could boom right along if we wanted to. We laid low and kept still, and never shoved out till nearly ten o'clock. Then we slid by, pretty wide away from the town, and didn't hoist our lantern till we was clear out of sight of it. When Jim called me to take the watch at four in the morning, he says, Huck, do you reckon we're going to run across any more kings on this trip? No, I says, I reckon not. Well, says he, that's all right then. I don't mind one or two kings, but that's enough. This one's powerful drunk, and the Duke ain't much better. I found Jim had been trying to get him to talk French, so he could hear what it was like. But he said he had been in this country so long and had so much trouble he forgot it. End of chapter 20「The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn » by Mark Twain Chapter 21 Sword Exercise Hamlet's Soliloquy They Loafed Around Town A Lazy Town Old Boggs dead it was after sun-up now but we went right on and didn't tie up the king and the duke turned out by and by looking pretty rusty but after they jumped overboard and took a swim it chippered them up a good deal after breakfast the king he took a seat on the corner of the raft 
and pulled off his boots and rolled up his breeches, and let his legs dangle in the water so as to be comfortable, and lit his pipe, and went to getting his Romeo and Juliet by heart. When he had got it pretty good, him and the Duke began to practice it together. The Duke had to learn him over and over again how to say every speech, and he made him sigh, and put his hand on his heart, and after a while he said he'd done it pretty well. Only, he says, you mustn't bellow out Romeo that way, like a bull. You must say it soft and sick and languishy, so Romeo. That is the idea, for Juliet's a dear, sweet, mere child of a girl, you know, and she doesn't bray like a jackass. Well, next they got out a couple of long swords that the Duke made out of oak lads and begun to practice the sword fight. The Duke called himself Richard the Third, and the way they laid on and pranced about the raft was grand to see. But by and by the king tripped and fell overboard, and after that they took a rest, and had to talk about all kinds of adventures they'd had in other times along the river. And after dinner, the Duke says, Well, Capit, we'll want to make this a first-class show, you know, so I guess we'll add a little more to it. We want a little something to answer encores with anyway. What's encores, Bilgewater? The Duke told him, and then says, I'll answer by doing the Highland Fling, or the Sailor's Hornpipe, and you, well, let me see. Oh, I've got it. You can do Hamlet's Soliloquy. Hamlet's which? Hamlet's Soliloquy. You know, the most celebrated thing in Shakespeare. Ah, it's sublime, sublime. Always fetches the house. I haven't got it in the book. I've only got one volume, but I reckon I can piece it out from memory. I'll just walk up and down a minute and see if I can call it back from recollection's vaults. So he went to marching up and down, thinking, and frowning horrible every now and then. Then he would hoist up his eyebrows. Next he would squeeze his hand on his forehead and stagger back a kind of moan. Next he would sigh, and next he let on to drop a tear. It was beautiful to see him. By and by he got it. He told us to give attention. Then he strikes a most noble attitude, with one leg shoved forwards, and his arms stretched away up, and his head tilted back, looking up at the sky. And then he begins to rip and rave and grit his teeth. And after that, all through his speech he howled, and spread around and swelled up his chest, and just knocked the spots out of any actor ever I have seen before. This is the speech. I learned it easy enough, while he was learning it to the king. To be or not to be, that is the bare bodkin that makes calamity of so long life. For who would Fidel's bear till Burnham would do come to Dunsinane? but that the fear of something after death murders the innocent sleep great nature's second course and makes us rather sling the arrows of outrageous fortune than fly to others that we know not of there's the respect must give us pause wake duncan with thy knocking i would thou couldst for who would bear the whips and scorns of time the oppressor's wrong the proud man's contumony the law's delay, and the quietus which his pangs might take. In the dead waste and middle of the night, when churchyards yawn in customary suits of solemn black, but that the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, breathes forth contagion on the world, and thus the native hue of resolution, like the poor cat, I the adage, is sickled o'er with care and all the clouds that lowered o'er our housetops with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action tis a consummation devoutly to be wished but soft you the fair ophelia up not thy ponderous and marble jaws but get thee to a nunnery go well the old man he liked that speech and he might as soon got it so he could do the first rate. It seemed like he was just born for it, and when he had his hand in and was excited, 
It was perfectly lovely the way he would rip and tear and rear up behind when he was getting it off. The first chance he got, the duke, he had some show bales printed, and after that, for two or three days, as we floated along, the raft was a most uncommon lively place, for there weren't nothing but sore fighting and rehearsing, as the duke called it, going on all the time. One morning, when we was pretty well down the state of Arkansas, we come in sight of a little one-horse town in a big bend, so we tied up about three-quarters of a mile above it in the mouth of a creek, which was shut in like a tunnel by the cypress trees. And all of us but Jim took the canoe and went down there to see if there was any chance in that place for our show. We struck it mighty lucky. There was going to be a circus there that afternoon, and the country people was already beginning to come in and all kinds of old shaggy wagons and on horses. The circus would leave before night, so our show would have a pretty good chance. The duke, he hired the courthouse, and we went around and stuck up our bills. They read like this. Shakespearean revival. Wonderful attraction. For one night only. The world-renowned tragedians. David Garrick the Younger. Of Drury Lane Theatre, London and Edmund Keene the Elder of the Royal Haymarket Theatre, Whitechapel, Pudding Lane, Piccadilly, London, and the Royal Continental Theatres, and their sublime Shakespearean spectacle, entitled The Balcony Scene in Romeo and Juliet. Romeo, Mr. Garrick, Juliet, Mr. Keene, assisted by the whole strength of the company. New costumes, new scenery, new appointments. Also, the thrilling masterly and blood-curdling broadsword conflict in Richard the Third, Richard the Third, Mr. Garrick, Richmond, Mr. Keene. Also, by special request, Hamlet's immortal soliloquy by the illustrious Keene, done by him three hundred consecutive nights in Paris, but one night only, on account of imperative European engagements, admission, twenty-five cents children and servants ten cents then we went loafing around town the stores and houses were most all old shackety dried up frame concerns that hadn't ever been painted they was set up three or four foot above ground on stilts so as to be out of reach of the water when the river was overflowed the houses had little gardens around them but they didn't seem to raise hardly anything in them but jimpson weeds and sunflowers and ash piles and old curled up boots and shoes and pieces of bottles and rags and played out tinware the fences was made of different kinds of boards nailed on at different times and they leaned every which way and had gates that didn't generally have but one hinge a leather one some of the fences had been whitewashed some time or another but the duke said it was in columbus's time likely enough there was generally hogs in the garden and people driving them out all the stores was along one street they had white domestic awnings in front and the country people hitched their horses to the awning posts there was empty dry goods boxes under the awnings and loafers roasting on them all day long whittling them with their barlow knives and chong tobacco and gaping and yawning and stretching a mighty ornery lot they generally had on yellow straw hats most as wide as an umbrella but didn't wear no coats or waistcoats they called one another bill and a buck and hank and joe and andy and talked lazy and drawly and used considerable many cuss words there was as many as one loafer leaning up against every on and post and he most always had his hands in his breeches pockets except when he fetched them out to lend a chaw of tobacco or scratch what a body was hearing amongst them all the time was give me a chaw of tobacco hank can't i ain't got but one chaw left ask bill maybe bill he gives him a chaw sometimes he lies and says he ain't got none some of them kind of loafers never has a cent in the world nor a chaw of tobacco of their own they get all their chawing by borrowing they say to a fellow i wished you'd lend me a chaw jack i'd just this minute give ben thompson the last chaw i had which is a lie 
pretty much every time. It don't fool nobody but a stranger, but Jack ain't no stranger, so he says. You give him a chaw, did you? So did your sister's cat's grandmother. You pay me back the chaws you've already borrowed off me, Leif Buckner, then I'll loan you one or two ton of it, and won't charge you no back interest, neither. Well, I did pay you back some of it once. Yes, you did. About six chaws. You borrowed store tobacco and paid back niggerhead. Store tobacco is flat black plug, but these fellows, mostly chaws, the natural leaf twisted. When they borrow a chaw, they don't generally cut it off with a knife, but set the plug in between their teeth, and gnaw with their teeth, and tug at the plug with their hands till they get it in two. Then sometimes the one that owns the tobacco looks mournful at it when it's handed back and says sarcastic here give me that chaw and you take the plug all the streets and lanes was just mud they weren't nothing else but mud mud as black as tar and nigh about a foot deep in some places and two or three inches deep in all the places the hogs loafed and grunted around everywheres you'd see a mighty sow and a litter of pigs come lazying along the street and wallop herself right down in the way where folks had to walk around her and she'd stretch out and shut her eyes and wave her ears while the pigs was milking her and look as happy as if she was on salary and pretty soon you'd hear a loafer singing out hi so boy sick him tig and away the sow would go squealing most horrible with a dog or two swinging to each ear and three or four dozen more are coming and then you would see all the loafers get up and watch the thing out of sight and laugh at the fun and look grateful for the noise then they settled back again till there was a dog fight there couldn't anything wake them up all over and make them happy all over like a dog fight unless it might be putting turpentine on a stray dog and setting fire to him or tying a tin pan to his tail and see him run himself to death on the river front some of the houses was sticking out over the bank and they was bowed and bent and about ready to tumble in the people had to move out of them the bank was caved away under one corner of some others and that corner was hanging over people lived in them yet but it was dangersome because sometimes a strip of land as wide as a house caves in at a time Sometimes a belt of land, a quarter of a mile a deep, will start in and cave along and cave along till it all caves into the river in one summer. Such a town as that has to be always moving back and back and back, because the river's always gnawing at it. The nearer it got to noon that day, the thicker and thicker was the wagons and horses in the streets, and more coming all the time. Families fetch their dinners with them from the country and eat them in the wagons there was considerable whiskey drinking going on and i see three fights by and by somebody sings out here comes old boggs in from the country for his little old monthly drunk here he comes boys all the loafers looked glad i reckon they was used to having fun out of boggs one of them says wonder who he's a gwine to chaw up this time if he'd a chawed up all the men he's been a gwine to chaw up in the last twenty year, he'd have considerable reputation now. Another one says, I wished old Boggs to threaten me, cause then I'd know I won't gwine to die for a thousand year. Boggs comes a-tearing along on his horse, whooping and yelling like a injun, and singing out, Clear the track there! I'm on the warpath, and the price of coffins is a gun to rise. He was drunk and weaving about in a saddle. He was over fifty year old and had a very red face. Everybody yelled at him and laughed at him and sassed him, and he sassed back and said he attend to them and lay them out in their regular turns but he couldn't wait now because he came to town to kill old Colonel Sherburne, and his motto was, 
meat first and spoon victuals to top off on he see me and rode up and says where'd you come from boy you prepared to die then he rode on i was scared but a man says he don't mean nothing he's always a carrying on like that when he's drunk he's the best naturedest old fool in arkansas never hurt nobody drunk nor sober boggs rode up before the biggest store in town and bent his head down so he could see under the curtain of the awning and yells come out here sherburn come out and meet the man you've swindled you're the hound i'm after and i'm gonna have you too and so he went on calling sherburn everything he could lay his tongue to and the whole street packed with people listening and laughing and going on by and by a proud-looking man about fifty-five and he was a heap the best dressed man in that town too steps out of a store and the crowd drops back on each side to let him come he says to boggs mighty calm and slow he says i'm tired of this but i'll endure it till one o'clock till one o'clock mine no longer if you open your mouth against me only once after that time you can't travel so far but i will find you then he turns and goes in the crowd looked mighty sober nobody stirred and there weren't no more laughing boggs rode off blackguard and sherburn as loud as he could yell all down the street and pretty soon back he comes and stops before the store still keeping it up some men crowded around him and tried to get him to shut up but he weren't they told him it would be one o'clock in about fifteen minutes and so he must go home he must go right away but it didn't do no good he cussed away with all his might and throwed his hat down in the mud and rode over it and pretty soon away he went a raging down the street again with his gray hair a-flying everybody that could get a chance at him tried their best to coax him off of his horse so they could lock him up and get him sober but it weren't no use up the street he could tear again and give sherburn another cussin by and by somebody says go for his daughter quick go for his daughter sometimes he'll listen to her if anybody can persuade him she can so somebody started on a run i walked down the street a ways and stopped in about five or ten minutes here comes boggs again but not on his horse he was a reeling across the street toward me bareheaded with a friend on both sides of him a whole of his arms and hurrying him along he was quiet and looked uneasy and he weren't hanging back any but was doing some of the hurrying himself somebody sings out box i looked over there to see who said it and it was that colonel sherburn he was standing perfectly still in the street and had a pistol raised in his right hand not aiming it but holding it out with the barrel tilted up toward the sky the same second i see a young girl come on the run and two men with her boggs and the men turn round to see who called them and when they see the pistol the men jumped to one side and the pistol barrel came down slow and steady to a level both barrels cocked boggs throws up both of his hands and says oh lord don't shoot bang goes the first shot and he staggers back clawing at the air bang goes the second one and he tumbles backwards onto the ground heavy and solid with his arms spread out that young girl screamed out and comes a rushin and down she throws herself onto her father crying and saying oh he's killed him he's killed him the crowd closed up around them and shouldered and jammed one another with their necks stretched trying to see and people on the inside trying to shove them back and shouting mac mac give him air give him air colonel sherburn he tossed his pistol on the ground and turned around on his heels and walked off they took boggs to a little drug store the crowd pressing around just the same 
and the whole town following, and I rushed and got a good place at the window, where I was close to him and could see in. They laid him on the floor, and put one large Bible under his head, and opened another one, and spread it on his breast. But they tore open his shirt first, and I seen where one of the bullets went in. He made about a dozen long gasps, his breast, lifting the Bible up when he drawed in his breath, and letting it down again when he breathed it out. And after that he laid still. He was dead. Then they pulled his daughter away from him, screaming and crying, and took her off. She was about sixteen, and very sweet and gentle-looking, but awful pale and scared. Well, pretty soon the whole town was there, squirming and scourging and pushing and shoving to get at the window and have a look. But people that had the places wouldn't give them up, and folks behind them was saying all the time, Say now, you've looked enough, you fellows. Tain't right and tain't fair for you to stay thar all the time and never give nobody a chance. Other folks has their rights as well as you. There was considerable jawing back, so I slid out, thinking maybe there was going to be trouble. The streets was full, and everybody was excited. Everybody that seen the shooting was telling how it happened, and there was a big crowd packed around each one of these fellows, stretching their necks and listening. One long, lanky man, with long hair and a big, white fur stove-pipe hat on the back of his head, and a crooked, handled cane, marked out of the places on the ground where Bog stood, and where Sherburn stood, and the people following him around from one place to the other, and watching everything he'd done, and bobbing their heads to show they understood, and stooping a little, and resting their hands on the thighs to watch him mark the places on the ground with his cane, and then he stood up straight and stiff where Sherburn had stood, frowning and having his hat brim down over his eyes, and sung out, Boggs! and then fetched his cane down slow to a level, and says, Bang! staggered backwards, and says, Bang! again, and fell down fat on his back. The people that had seen the thing said he'd done it perfect, said it was just exactly the way it all happened. Then, as much as a dozen people got out their bottles and treated him, well, by and by, somebody said Sherburn ought to be lynched. In about a minute, everybody was saying it, so away they went, mad and yelling, and snatching down every clothesline they come to, to do the hanging with. End of chapter 21「The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn » by Mark Twain Chapter 22 Sherburn Attending the Circus Intoxication in the Ring The Thrilling Tragedy They swarmed up toward Sherburn's house, a-whooping and raging like injuns, and everything had to clear the way, or get run over, and tromp to smush, and it was awful to see. Children was heeling it ahead of the mob screaming and trying to get out of the way and every window along the road was full of women's heads and there was nigger boys in every tree and books and wenches looking over every fence and as soon as the mob would get nearly to them they would break and skedaddle back out of reach lots of women and girls was crying and talking on scared most to death they swarmed up in front of sherburne's palings as thick as they could jam together, and you couldn't hear yourself think for the noise. It was a little twenty-foot yard. Some sung out, Ted on the fence! Ted on the fence! Then there was a racket of ripping and tearing and smashing, and down she goes, and the front wall of the crowd begins to roll in like a wave. Just then, Sherburn steps out onto the roof of his little front porch with a double barrel gun in his hand and takes his stand perfectly calm and deliberate not saying a word the racket stopped and the wave sucked back sherburne never said a word just stood there looking down the stillness was awful creepy and uncomfortable sherburne run his eyes slow 
along the crowd, and wherever it struck, the people tried a little to outgaze him, but they couldn't. They dropped their eyes and looked sneaky. Then pretty soon Sherburne sort of laughed. Not the pleasant kind, but the kind that makes you feel like when you are eating bread that's got sand in it. Then he says, slow and scornful, The idea of you lynching anybody. It's amusing. The idea of you thinking you had pluck enough to lynch a man, because you are brave enough to tar and feather poor friendless cast-out women that come along here, did that make you think you had grit enough to lay your hands on a man? Why, a man safe in the hands of ten thousand of your kind, as long as it's daytime and you are not behind him? Do I know you? I know you clear through. I was born and raised in the South, and I've lived in the North. So I know the average all around. The average man's a coward. In the North he lets anybody walk over him that wants to, and goes home and prays for a humble spirit to bear it. In the South one man all by himself has stopped a stage full of men in the daytime and robbed the lot. Your newspapers call you a brave people so much that you think you are braver than any other people, whereas you are just as brave and no braver. Why don't your juries hang murderers? Because they are afraid the man's friends will shoot them in the back in the dark, and it's just what they would do. So they always acquit, and then a man goes in the night with a hundred masked cowards at his back and lynches the rascal. Your mistake is that you didn't bring a man with you. That's one mistake. And the other is that you didn't come in the dark and fetch your masks. You brought part of a man, Buck Harness, there. And if you hadn't had him to start you, you would have taken it out in blowing. You didn't want to come. The average man don't like trouble and danger. You don't like trouble and danger. But if only half a man, like Buck Harness, there, shouts, lynch him, lynch him, you are afraid to back down. Afraid you'll be found out to be what you are, cowards. And so you raise a yell and hang yourselves onto that half a man's coat tail and come raging up here, swearing what big things you are going to do. The pitifulest thing out is a mob. That's what an army is, a mob. They don't fight with courage that's born in them, but with courage that's borrowed from their mass and from their officers. But a mob without any man at the head of it is beneath pitifulness. Now the thing for you to do is to droop your tails and go home and crawl in a hole. If any real lynching's going to be done, it will be done in the dark, southern fashion. And when they come, they'll bring their masks and fetch a man along. Now leave, and take your half-man with you. Tossing his gun up across his left arm, and cocking it when he says this, the crowd washed back sudden, and then broke all apart, and went tearing off every which way, and Buck Harkness, he healed it after them, looking terrible cheap. I could have stayed if I wanted to, but I didn't want to. I went to the circus and loafed around the back side till the watchman went by and then dived in under the tent. I had my twenty-dollar gold piece and some other money, but I reckoned I'd better save it, because there ain't no telling how soon you are going to need it away from home and amongst strangers that way. You can't be too careful. I ain't opposed to spending money on circuses when there ain't no other way, but there ain't no use. In wasting it on them. It was a real bully circus. It was the splendidest sight that ever was when they all come riding in, two and two, and gentlemen and lady side by side. The men just in their drawers and undershirts, and no shoes or stirrups, and resting their hands on their thighs easy and comfortable. There must have been twenty of them, and every lady with a lovely complexion and perfectly beautiful, and looking just like a gang of real sure enough queens, and dressed in clothes that cost millions of dollars, and just littered with diamonds. 
It was a powerful fine sight. I never see anything so lovely. And then, one by one, they got up and stood, and went a-weaving around the ring so gentle and wavy and graceful. The men looking over so tall and airy and straight, with their heads bobbing and skimming along, away up there, under the tent roof, and every lady's rose-leafy dress flapping soft and silky around her hips, and she looking like the most loveliest parasol. And then, faster and faster they went, all of them dancing, first one foot out in the air, and then the other, the horses leaning more and more, and the ringmaster going round and round the center pole, cracking his whip and shouting, Hi! Hi! And the clown cracking jokes behind him, and by and by all hands dropped the reins, and every lady put her knuckles on her hips, and every gentleman folded his arms, and then how the horses did lean over and hump themselves, and so one after the other they all skipped off into the ring, and made the sweetest bow I ever see, and then scampered out, and everybody clapped their hands, and went just about wild. Well, all through the circus they done the most astonishing things, and all the time that clown carried on so it most killed the people. The ringmaster couldn't ever say a word to him, but he was back at him quick as a wink, with the funniest things a body ever said, and how he ever could think of so many of them, and so sudden and so pat was what I couldn't no way understand. Why, I couldn't a thought of them in a year, and by and by, a drunk man tried to get into the ring, said he wanted to ride, said he could ride as well as anybody that ever was. They argued and tried to keep him out, but he weren't listen, and the whole show came to a standstill. Then the people began to holler at him and make fun of him, and that made him mad, and he began to rip and tear, so that stirred up the people, and a lot of men began to pile down off of the benches and swarm towards the ring, saying, Knock him down, throw him out, and one or two women begun to scream. So then, the ringmaster, he had made a little speech, and said he hoped there weren't be no more disturbances, and if the man would promise he wouldn't make no more trouble, he would let him ride if he thought he could stay on the horse. So everybody laughed, and said all right, and the man got on. The minute he was on, the horse began to rip and tear and jump and cavort around, with two circus men hanging on to his bridle, trying to hold him and the drunk man hanging on to his neck, and his heels flying in the air every jump, and the whole crowd of people standing up and shouting and laughing till the tears rolled down. And at last, sure enough, all the circus men could do, the horse broke loose, and away he went, like the very nation, round and round the ring, and with that sot laying down on him and hanging to his neck, with first one leg hanging most to the ground on one side, and then to other one on to other side, and the people were just crazy. It weren't funny to me, though. It was all of a tremble to see his danger. But pretty soon he struggled up astride and grabbed the bridle, a reeling this way and that, and the next minute he sprung up and dropped the bridle and stood, and the horse a-going like a house afire, too. He just stood up there a sailing around as easy and as comfortable as if he weren't ever drunk in his life. And then he began to pull off his clothes and sling them. He shed them so thick they kind of clogged up the air, and altogether he shed seventeen suits. And then there he was, slim and handsome, and dressed the gaudiest and prettiest you ever saw. And he lit into that horse with his whip and made him fairly hum and kindly skipped off, and made his bow, and danced off to the dressing-room, and everybody just a howling with pleasure and astonishment. Then the ringmaster, he see how he had been fooled, and he was the sickest ringmaster you ever see, I reckon. Why, it was one of his own men. He had got up that joke all out of his own head, and never let on to nobody. Well, I felt sheepish enough, 
to be took in so but i wouldn't have been in that ringmaster's place not for a thousand dollars i don't know there may be bullier circuses than what that one was but i never struck them yet anyways it was plenty good enough for me and whenever i run across it it can have all my custom every time well that night we had our show but there weren't only about twelve people there just enough to pay expenses and they laughed all the time and that made the duke mad and everybody left anyway before the show was over but one boy which was asleep so the duke said these arkansas lunkheads couldn't come up to shakespeare what they wanted was a low comedy and maybe something rather worse than low comedy he reckoned he said he could size their style so next morning he got some big sheets of wrapping paper and some black paint and drawed off some handbills and struck them up all over the village the bill said at the courthouse for three nights only the world-renowned tragedians david garrick the younger and edmund keen the elder of the london and continental theatres in the thrilling tragedy of the king's camelpard or the royal nonsuch admission of fifty cents then at the bottom was the biggest line of all which said ladies and children not admitted there says he if that line don't fetch them i don't know arkansas end of chapter twenty two the adventures of huckleberry finn by mark twain chapter twenty three sold royal comparisons jim gets homesick well all day him and the king was hard at it ringing up a stage and a curtain and a row of candles for footlights and that night the house was jammed full of men in no time when the place couldn't hold no more the duke he quit tending door and went around the back way and come on to the stage and stood up before the curtain and made a little speech and praised up his tragedy and said it was the most thrillingest one that ever was and so he went on a bragging about his tragedy and about edmund keen the elder which was to play the main principal part in it and at last when he had got everybody's expectations up high enough he rolled up the curtain and the next minute the king came a-prancing out on all fours naked and he was painted all over ring-streaked and striped all sorts of colors as splendid as a rainbow and but never mind the rest of his outfit it was just wild but it was awful funny the people most killed themselves laughing and when the king got done campering and campered off behind the scenes they roared and clapped and stormed and ha ha till he came back and done it over again and after that they made him do it another time well it would make a cow laugh to see the shines that old idiot cut then the duke he lets the curtain down and bows to the people and says the great tragedy will be performed only two nights more on accounts of pressing london engagements where the seats is all sold already for it in dreary lane and then he makes them another bow and says if he has succeeded in pleasing them in instructing them he will be deeply obliged if they will mention it to their friends and get them to come and see it twenty people sings out what is it, is it all over is, is that, that all the duke says yes then there was a fine time everybody sings out sold and rose up mad and was a-goin for that stage in them tragedians but a big fine-lookin man jumps up on a bench and shouts hold on just a word gentlemen they stopped to listen we are sold mighty badly sold but we don't want to be the laughing stock of this whole town i reckon and never hear the last of this thing as long as we live 
no what we want is to go out of here quiet and talk this show up and sell the rest of the town then we'll all be in the same boat ain't that sensible you bet it is judge is right everybody sings out all right then not a word about any sell go along home and advise everybody to come and see the tragedy next day you couldn't hear nothing around that town but how splendid that show was house was jammed again that night and we sold this crowd the same way when me and the king and the duke got home to the raft we all had a supper and by and by about midnight they made jim and me back her out and float her down the middle of the river and fetch her in and hide her about two mile below town the third night the house was crammed again and they weren't newcomers this time but people that was at the show the other two nights i stood by the duke at the door and i see that every man that went in had his pockets bulging or something muffled up under his coat and i see it weren't no perfumery neither not by a long sight i smelt sickly eggs by the barrel and rotten cabbages and such things and if i know the signs of a dead cat being around and i bet i do there was sixty-four of them went in i shoved in there for a minute but it was too various for me i couldn't stand it well when the place couldn't hold no more people the duke he gave the fellow a quarter and told him to tend door for him a minute and then he started around for the stage door and i after him but the minute we turned the corner and was in the dark he says walk fast now till you get away from the houses and then shin for the raft like the dickens was after you i done it and he done the same we struck the raft at the same time and in less than two seconds we was gliding downstream all dark and still and edging towards the middle of the river nobody saying a word i reckoned the poor king was in for a gaudy time of it when the audience but nothing of the sort pretty soon he crawls out from under the wigwam and says well how the old thing pan out this time duke he hadn't been uptown at all we never showed a lot till we was about ten mile below the village then we lit up and had a supper and the king and the duke fairly laughed their bones loose over the way they served them people the duke says greenhorns flatheads i knew the first house would keep mum and let the rest of the town get roped in and i knew they'd lay for us the third night and consider it was their turn now well it is their turn and i'd give something to know how much they'd take for it i would just like to know how they're putting in their opportunity they can turn it into a picnic if they want to they brought plenty provisions them rapscallions took in four hundred and sixty-five dollars in that three night i never see money hauled in by the wagon load like that before by and by when they was asleep and snoring jim says don't it surprise you the way dem kings carries on huck no i says it don't why don't it huck well it don't because it's in the breed i reckon they're all alike but huck these kings are on is regular rap scallions that's just what they is they's regular rap scallions well that's what i'm a saying all kings is mostly rap scallions as fur as i can make out is dat so you read about them once you'll see look at henry the eighth this sends a sunday school superintendent to him and look at charles second and louis fourteen and louis fifteen and james second and edward second and richard third and forty more besides all them sexton heparchies that used to rip around so in the old times and raise cane ma you ought to seen old henry the eighth when he was in bloom he was a blossom he used to marry a new wife every day and chop off her head next morning 
and he would do it just as indifferent as if he was ordering up eggs. Fetch up Neil Gwynne, he says. They fetch her up. Next morning, chop off her head, and they chop it off. Fetch up Jane Shore, he says, and up she comes. Next morning, chop off her head, and they chop it off. Ring up Fair Rosamond. Fair Rosamond answers the bell. Next morning, chop off her head, and he made every one of them tell him a tale every night, and he kept that up till he had hogged a thousand and one tales that way, and then he put them all in a book, and calls it Doomsday Book, which was a good name, and stated the case. You don't know kings, Jim, but I know them, and this old rip of iron is one of the cleanest I've struck in history. Well, Henry, he takes a notion he wants to get up some trouble with his country. How does he go at it? Give notice? Give the country a show? No. All of a sudden, he heaves all the tea in Boston Harbor overboard, and whacks out a declaration of independence, and dares them to come on. That was his style. He never give anybody a chance. He had suspicions of his father, the Duke of Wellington. Well, what did he do? Ask him to show up? No. Drowned him in a butt of mamsey, like a cat. Suppose people left money laying around where he was. What did he do? He collared it. Suppose he contracted to do a thing, and you paid him, and didn't sit down there and see that he'd done it. What did he do? He always done the other thing. Suppose he opened his mouth. What then? If he didn't shut it up powerful quick, he'd lose a lie every time. That's the kind of a bug Henry was, and if we'd a had him along, stead of our kings, he'd a fooled that town a heap worse than ourn done. I don't say that ourn is lambs, because they ain't, when you come right down to the cold facts, but they ain't nothing to that old ram anyway. All I say is, kings is kings, and you got to make allowances. Take them all around. They're a mighty ornery lot. It's the way they're raised. But this one do smell so like the nation, huh? Well, they all do, Jim. We can't help the way a king smells. History don't tell no way. Now, the Duke, he's a tolerable likely man in some ways. Yes, a Duke's different, but not very different. This one's a middling hard lot for a duke. When he's drunk, there ain't no near-sighted man could tell him from a king. Well, anyways, I don't hanker for no more on em. Huck, that's a his all I can stand. It's the way I feel, too, Jim. But we've got them on our hands, and we got to remember what they are, and make allowances. Sometimes I wish we could hear a country that's out of kings. What was the use to tell Jim these weren't real kings and dukes? It weren't a done no good. And besides, it was just as I said. You couldn't tell them from the real kind. I went to sleep, and Jim didn't call me when it was my turn. He often done that. When I waked up, just at daybreak, he was sitting there with his head down betwixt his knees, moaning and mourning to himself. I don't take notice, nor let on. I knowed what it was about. He was thinking about his wife and his children, away up yonder, and he was low and homesick, because he hadn't ever been away from home before in his life. And I do believe he cared just as much for his people as white folks do for theirn. It don't seem natural, but I reckon it so. He was often moaning and mourning that way nights, when he judged I was asleep, and saying, Poor little Elizabeth, poor little Johnny, it's mighty hard I speck I ain't ever going to see you no more, no more. He was a mighty good nigger, Jim was. But this time, I somehow got to talking to him about his wife and young'uns, and by and by, he says, well, what makes me feel so bad this time is because 
I hear something over yonder in the bank, like a whack or a slam a while ago, and it mind me of the time I treat my little Elizabeth so ornery. She wa'n't only about four year old, and she took the sky yarlet fever and had a powerful rough spell, but she got well, and one day she was standing round, and I says to her, I says, shut the door. She never done it, just stood there, kind of smiling up at me, make me mad, and I says again, mighty loud, I says, don't you hear me? Shut the door. She just stood there, same way, kind of smiling up. I was a boil, and I says, I lay I make you mine, and with that I fetch her a slap side the head that sunk her a sprawling. Then I went into the other room, and I was gone about ten minutes, and when I come back, there was that door standing open yet, and that child standing most right in it, looking down and mourning and the tears running down. My, but I was mad. I was going for that child. But just then, it was a door that opened in it. Just then, long come the wind and slam it too behind the child. Kablam! In my land, the child never move. My breath most hop out of me, and I feel so, so I don't know how I feel. I crope out all a-trembling and crope around and open the door easy and slow and poke my head in behind, soft and still, and all of a sudden I says, Pow! Just as loud as I could yell. She never budge. Oh, I bust out a crying and grab her up in my arms and say, Oh, the poor little thing, the Lord God Almighty, forgive poor old Jim, cares he never grown to forgive himself as long as he live. Oh, she was plumb deaf and dumb, Huck, plumb deaf and dumb, and I'd been a-treatin' her so. End of chapter 23《The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn》by Mark Twain Chapter 24 Jim in Royal Robes They Take a Passenger Getting Information Family Grief Next day, towards night, we laid up under a little willow tow head out in the middle, where there was a village on each side of the river, and the Duke and the King began to lay out a plan for working them towns. Jim, he spoke to the Duke, and said he hoped it wouldn't take but a few hours, because it got mighty heavy and tiresome to him when he had to lay all day in the wigwam tied with a rope. You see, when we left him all alone, we had to tie him, because if anybody happened on to him all by himself, and not tied, it wouldn't look much like he was a runaway nigger, you know. So the Duke said it was kind of hard to have to lay roped all day, and he cipher out some way to get around it. He was uncommon bright, the Duke was, and he soon struck it. He dressed Jim up in the King Lear's outfit. It was a long curtain calico gown and a white horsehair wig and whiskers. And then he took his theater paint and painted Jim's face and hands and ears and neck all over a dead, dull, solid blue, like a man that's been drowned nine days. Blamed if he weren't the horriblest looking outrage I ever see. Then the Duke took out and wrote out a sign on a shingle so, Sick Arab, but harmless when not out of his head. And he nailed that shingle to a lath, and stood the lath up four or five foot in front of the wigwam, Jim was satisfied. He said it was a sight better than lying tied a couple of years every day, and trembling all every time there was a sound. The Duke told him to make himself free and easy, and if anybody ever come meddling around, he must hop out of the wigwam and carry on a little, and fetch a howl or two like a wild beast, and he reckoned they would light out and leave him alone, which was sound enough judgment. But you take the average man, and he wouldn't wait for him to howl. Why, 
he didn't only look like he was dead he looked considerable more than that these rapscallions wanted to try the nun such again because there was so much money in it but they judged it wouldn't be safe because maybe the news might a worked along down by this time they couldn't hit no project that suited exactly and so at last the duke said he reckoned he'd lay off and work his brains an hour or two and see if he couldn't put up something on the arkansas village and the king he allowed he would drop over to other village without any plan but just trust in providence to lend him the profitable way meaning the devil i reckon we had all bought store clothes where we stopped last and now the king put his in on and he told me to put mine on i done it of course the king's duds was all black and he did look real swell and starchy i never knowed how clothes could change a body before why before he looked like the orniest old rip that ever was but now when he take off his new white beaver and make a bow to do a smile he looked that grand and good and pious that you'd say he walked right out of the ark and maybe it was old leviticus himself jim cleaned up the canoe and i got my paddle ready there was a big steamboat lying at the shore way up under the point about three mile above the town been there a couple of hours ticking on freight says the king seeing how i'm dressed i reckon maybe i'd better arrive down from st louis or cincinnati or some other big place go for the steamboat huckleberry we'll come down to the village on her i didn't have to be ordered twice to go and take a steamboat ride i fetched ashore a half a mile above the village and then went scootin along the bluff bank in the easy water pretty soon we come to a nice innocent-looking young country jake setting on a log swabbing the sweat off his face for it was powerful warm weather and he had a couple of big carpet bags by him run her nose in shore says the king i done it where you bound for young man for the steamboat going to orleans get on board says the king hold on a minute my servant will help you with them bags jump out and help the gentleman aldolphus meaning me i see i done so and then we all three started on again the young chap was mighty thankful said it was tough work totting his baggage such weather he asked the king where he was going and the king told him he'd come down the river and landed at the other village this morning and now he was going up a few mile to see an old friend and a farm up there the young fellow says when i first see you i says to myself it's mr wilkes sure and he come mighty near getting here in time but then i says again no i reckon it ain't him or else he wouldn't be paddling up the river you ain't him are you no my name's bludgett alexander bludgett reverend alexander bludgett i suppose i must say as i'm one of the lord's poorest servants but still i'm just as able to be sorry for mr wilkes for not arriving in time all the same if he's missed anything by it which i hope he hasn't well he don't miss any property by it because he'll get that all right but he's missed seeing his brother peter die which he mayn't mind nobody can tell as to that but his brother would a give anything in this world to see him before he died never talked about nothing else all these three weeks hadn't seen him since they was boys together and hadn't ever seen his brother william at all that's the deaf and dumb one william ain't more than thirty or thirty-five peter and george were the only ones that come out here george was the married brother him and his wife both died last year harvey and william's the only ones that's left now and as i was saying they haven't got here in time did anybody send em word oh yes a month or two ago when peter was first took because peter said then that he sort of felt like he weren't going to get well this time 
You see, he was pretty old, and George's girls were too young to be much company for him, except Mary Jane, the red-headed one, and so he was kind of lonesome after George and his wife died, and didn't seem to care much to live. He most desperately wanted to see Harvey, and William too, for that matter, because he was one of them kind that can't bear to make a will. He left a letter behind for Harvey, and said he'd told in it where his money was hid, and how he wanted the rest of the property divided up so that George's girls would be all right, for George didn't leave nothing. And that letter was all they could get him to put a pen to. Why do you reckon Harvey don't come? Where does he live? Oh, he lives in England, Sheffield, preaches there, hasn't ever been in this country. He hasn't had any too much time. And besides, he mightn't have got the letter at all, you know. Too bad, too bad, he couldn't a lived to see his brothers, the poor soul. You going to Orleans, you say? Yes, but that ain't only a part of it. I'm going in a ship next Wednesday for Rio de Janeiro, where my uncle lives. It's a pretty long journey, but it'll be lovely. Wished I was going. Is Mary Jane the oldest? How old is the others? Mary Jane's nineteen, Susan's fifteen, and Joanna's about fourteen. That's the one that gives herself to good works and has a hair lip. Poor things. To be left alone in the cold world, so? Well, they could be worse off. Old Peter had friends, and they ain't going to let them come to no harm. There is Hobson, the Baptist preacher, and Deacon Lord Hovey, and Ben Rucker, and Abner Shackelford, and Levi Bell, the lawyer, and Dr. Robinson, and their wives, and the widow Bartley, and... Well, there's a lot of them. But these are the ones that Peter was thickest with, and used to write about sometimes, when he wrote home. So how will know where to look for friends when he gets here? Well, the old man went on asking questions, till he just fairly emptied that young fellow. Blamed if he didn't inquire about everybody and everything in that blessed town, and all about the Wilkeses, and about Peter's business, which was a tanner and about George's, which was a carpenter, and about Harvey's, which was a dissentering minister, and so on and so on. Then he says, What did you want to walk all the way up to the steamboat for? Because she's a big Orleans boat, and I was afeard she mightn't stop there. When they're deep, they won't stop for a hill. A Cincinnati boat will, but this is a St. Louis one. Was Peter Wilkes well off? Oh, yeah, pretty well off. He had houses and land, and it's reckoned he left three or four thousand in cash hid up summers. When did you say he died? I didn't say, but it was last night. Funeral tomorrow, likely? Yes, about the middle of the day. Well, it's all terrible sad, but we all got to go, one time or another. So what we want to do so is be prepared. Then we'll be all right. Yes, sir, it's the best way. Ma used to always say that. When we struck the boat, she was about done loading, and pretty soon she got off. The king never said nothing about going aboard, so I lost my ride after all. When the boat was gone, the king made me a paddle up another mile to a lonesome place, and then he got ashore and says, Now hustle back right off, and fetch the duke up here, and the new carpet bags. And if he's gone over to the other side, go over there and get him, and tell him to get himself up regardless. Shove along now. I see what he was up to, but I never said nothing, of course. When I got back with the duke, we hid the canoe, and then they sat down on a log, and the king told him everything, just like the young fellow had said it, every last word of it. And all the time he was a-doing it, he tried to talk like an Englishman, and he done it pretty well, too, for a slouch. I can't imitate him, and so I ain't going to try to, but he really done it pretty good. Then he says, How are you on the deaf and dumb, Bilgewater? The duke said, Leave him alone for that. Said he had played a deaf and dumb person on the histronic boards. So then they waited for a steamboat. About the middle of the afternoon a couple of little boats come along, but they didn't come from high enough up the river. 
but at last there was a big one and they hailed her she sent out her yawl and we went aboard and she was from cincinnati and when they found we only wanted to go four or five mile they was boomin mad and gave us a cussin and said they wouldn't land us but the king was calm he says if gentlemen can afford to pay a dollar a mile apiece to be took on and put off in a yawl a steamboat can afford to carry em can it so they softened down and said it was all right and when we got to the village they yawled us ashore about two dozen men flocked down when they see the yawl a comin and when the king says can any of you gentlemen tell me where mr peter wilkes lives they gave a glance at one another and nodded their heads as much as to say what did i tell you then one of them said kind of a soft and gentle i'm sorry sir but the best we can do is to tell you where he did live yesterday evening sudden as winking the ornery old creature went in to smash and fell up against the man and put his chin on his shoulder and cried down his back and says alas alas our poor brother gone and we never got to see him oh it's too too hard then he turns around blubbering and makes a lot of idiotic signs to the duke on his hands and blamed if he didn't drop a carpet bag and bust out crying if they weren't the beatenest lot them two frauds that ever i struck well the men gathered around and sympathized with them and said all sorts of kind things to them and carried their carpet bags up the hill for them and let them lean on them and cry and told the king all about his brother's last moments and the king he told it all over again on his hands to the duke and both of them took on about that dead tanner like they'd lost the twelve disciples well if i ever struck anything like it i'm a nigger it was enough to make a body ashamed of the human race End of chapter twenty four